everyone. Thank you for joining our monthly fireside. My name is Tiff Ho, and I am the executive director of Foundation Beyond Belief. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let you know that we are live streaming on Facebook. Uh, tonight's fireside is on our Humanist Action Ghana program, which has a few announcements coming up. I'm really excited to have uh, Yvonne, our Ghana coordinator, talk about that. Um, before we get started, though, I do have a few announcements to make. So as many of you might know, we have been restructuring uh, FBB, and that has included narrowing down our mission statement. Um, in the past year, you've seen us relaunch our Compassionate Impact Grant. We've also launched a food security program. And so our next step changes really include Humanist Action Ghana. We have committed to taking an anti-colonialist uh, framework. And with that, um, we have four panelists tonight. So our panelists tonight who are going to speak on Ghana are Yvonne. She is the administrator of the Humanist Action Ghana program and has been with it to the be from the beginning. She is currently leading the program um, and has done a lot of great work over the past few years. We also have Connor. Robinson Connor is the founder of the Ghana program, a humanist speaker and activist. Uh, we also have Christian Hayden, who's a former Ghana program volunteer, and he is now a um, facilitator, writer, and media maker. And finally, we have Wendy Weber, who's a programs director at Foundation Beyond Belief. She is the past Ghana program administrator and volunteer, and she has been with the program since the beginning. Um, I'm just going to give each of our panelists a few minutes to talk about themselves, talk about their history with the program, and then we'll turn it over for questions to the entire panel. Um, during that time, please feel free to put your questions into the chat box. All right, so I'm going to start with Yvonne, because Yvonne has been leading the program for the past few years now. Um, so Yvonne... Could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? She may have actually just stepped away to deal with Damien. I thought she might be having technical difficulties again. Um, I mean, in that case, uh, we could start with you, Connor, since I know you founded the program and you could just tell us a little bit about what made you, what inspired you to found the program, um, how you chose the location of Ghana and where um, you see it going. Well, um, a lot has changed uh, since we since we first set out to uh, pick a location to launch what at the time was called the Humanist Service Corps um, and where we are now. And I couldn't be more excited about all of those changes and the direction. Um, Wendy was with me on the uh, the year long um, scouting trip, you might call it, which was called Pathfinders Project, where we visited um, more than eight locations and we did projects uh, with grassroots organizations in those locations in order to basically see if they would be good places for us to launch a permanent volunteering program for humanists. Um, obviously, Ghana won out um, for reasons that are on the FBB blog and that that you know, there are FEB videos um, out in the world explaining. Um, but the reason why we wanted to start a volunteering program was one, to really embody the values of humanism in service and um, put an example out into the world um, that people could point to and say, this is what humanist service looks like. Um, for a couple of different reasons. One, to, to push back on um, some of the really harmful forms of service that are out there. Um, one of the things we like to say when we were talking about the first years of the Humanist Service Corps is, is that uh, there's a long history of oppression masquerading as service. And we wanted to use the values of humanism um, and the Humanist Service Corps program, as it was called at the time, as an opportunity to talk about uh, what responsible service really looks like um, and really getting away from the idea of service at all. Um, we shouldn't be talking about service. We should be talking about learning and relationship building. Um, and the, 
Um, and also to make the argument to non-religious people as well, um, because there are, um, I think there are large contingents in the free thought movement that deify reason and that think that just arguing with people is enough of a contribution to the world. And we wanted to say like, hey, not only is this, um, a true contribution. Not only will not only will this get you toward the goals that you want as a humanist or as a rationalist, um, it's also your most effective argument. Your most effective argument that religion doesn't have a monopoly on goodness is non-religious people being good. And being good means raising the standard of living around the world for everyone, um, right? It means not being colonialist. So we had an explicitly anti-neocolonialist goal and Initially, um, I had hoped when we started in Ghana that um, we would be able to have a Ghanaian program coordinator, program director within three to five years. Um, and instead of three to five years, we had Yvonne show up as a volunteer from day one, and she was clearly the person to lead the program forward. And so we were able to make that transition to local leadership within one to two years instead of three to five years. And now of course the, the program is entirely under Ghanaian leadership and I couldn't be more excited about that. That's exactly, I think how it should be for any program. So I think that's enough to start. Thank you, Connor. One of our goals, as you've mentioned, has been to lead an anti-colonialist, um, uh, um, apply an anti-colonial framework, continuing the work that you have put forth uh, in the human program, which you know was once human service for. Uh, since you spoke about Yvonne and being the person to lead the program, um, I see Yvonne is back now and I want to give her a chance to introduce herself and her history with the program. Hello everyone, my name is Yvonne and I'm the program coordinator for the Humanist Action Ghana. Uh, like Connor said, I started out as a volunteer in the first year of the program. And over time, um, I eventually became the coordinator of the program and uh, saw the program develop year after year. Um, Humanist Action Ghana is a vocational training program It's a vocational training program for Ghanaian women, which began in 2015 under Connor Robinson. Our program provides young girls and women with an alternative means of education and financial support. We seek to solve generational poverty and gender inequality, increase education, and reduce the rate of child marriage and teenage pregnancy for Ghanaian women. Our current program teaches young girls and women sewing in Cape Coast here in Ghana. Uh, we are training 10 trainees with four trainers. As we have grown, we have faced some challenges. In 2020, last year, uh, faced with the COVID pandemic, we were forced to shut down for a few months and we pivoted towards providing food for our trainees, the trainers, their families, and other members of the community. Over the course of eight months, we provided food and necessities to 130 families. In October, we reopened. Our trainees have continued to make outstanding progress in a short period of time, and we graduate from the program at the end of September. As we move towards graduation, we have started to set up Humanist Action Ghana for the next cohort. In the next several months, Humanist Action Ghana will be transitioning to an NGO, independent from Foundation Beyond Belief and led by myself. Additionally, we'll be moving the program to the Northern region of Ghana, specifically Tamale, and growing our program to include 25 trainees and five trainers. So exciting. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you so much, Yvonne. As Yvonne has mentioned, we are making some huge changes and I know there's probably going to be some questions on that. Um, 
So definitely want to talk a little bit more about that later on. But before we do that, I kind of want to give everyone else a chance to introduce themselves. Um, so Christian, I know you were volunteering your time uh, very generously with the Humanist Service Corps program at the time, now Humanist Action Ghana. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your experience? So I'll say that um, it always struck me uh, having been having served on the inaugural team about like how often we did kind of engage in the conversation of like how and what we're doing is impacting the community. Um, what, what, what challenges we were facing, whether this was optimal, whether this was in line with our mission, what it should look like next year uh, for, the, for the next team. And to see it constantly, uh, the program constantly evolve um, under the leadership of Yvonne is, um, it's really cool. Um, and, and, and it also makes me feel like, you know, I, I have to find different talking points when I uh, <laughs> explain my time. And it's, I always, you know, but I do feel probably the, I do feel like the, the a guilt though, when you say generously uh, give my time, because I definitely think like, you know, much like a lot of service programs, I felt like I got a lot of the benefits uh, of that, um, which, you know, there's a, a little bit of guilt about, but um, it, it, the gratitude um, to, to, to Ghana, but also the teams um, and, and, and what the kind of growth that that um, elicited. And, but it's cool to see that now that that, is, that growth and those opportunities for growth is, 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 are focused on people from the community. Um, and I think that's a great way to kind of make it full circle. I'm myself curious because it's kind of like a, a return home uh, to be back in the Northern region. Um, and, and I guess I have as many questions as, 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 as much as I, I might be expected to speak probably more, but like in like, but, but, but genuine, like I think it's excitement uh, because I, you know, I'm, I, I miss certain aspects of the North continuously still thinking about having tea, coffee at the roadside, and egg sandwiches and uh, speaking broken duck Bonley. Uh, any chance I get. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, which is why I love Clubhouse. This is a tangent, but uh, I stopped in the Doug Bonley group and they didn't make fun of me when I tried to speak. So, there's a Doug uh, Bonley group? Yeah, there's a Doug Bond network. Like, uh, they have a like check in. And so, uh, they were actually pretty warm to me as a, as a non, non Ghanaian. Uh, they were like, oh, you, oh. <laughs> it, was, it was like a lot of O's like oh this is that's interesting that you that you came through um but yeah so there's a lot of affinity for um uh the north particularly kind of dagoon uh uh things even though I'd probably be working with other other ethnicities as well so um yeah i'm just excited to to be here and to share um and and ask hopefully some good questions Thank you, Christian. Um, first of all, Clubhouse is amazing. <laughs> but we, yeah, I think that there's definitely a lot of questions about why there's this return to the North. Uh, we've been in Central Ghana uh, for a bit now, but Yvonne can definitely answer a little bit of those questions, um, fill in the gaps of why we're going to return there. Uh, but for now, we have Wendy is our next panelist. Um, She's been with the program also since the beginning and she's evolved into FBB's current program director. Um, and she and Yvonne have worked very closely on the program as well over the last few years. So she's been, seen it through all the transitions and she's going to continue to see it through its independence. Um, so Wendy, if you please tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so um, I mean, I a lot of my involvement's already been mentioned, but I got started with you know, what was then Pathfinders Project back, um, you know, almost 10 years ago now. And uh, I guess a little less than that. And I had never heard of Foundation Beyond Belief before. And so that was like, that is 
the reason why I'm here now because I uh, applied to be part of this uh, volunteer program that just sounded amazing and to like be able to find the location for an, a program like this was very exciting. Um, and so that it changed the course of my life, obviously. Um, what was incredible about that first year was, uh, well, cause you know, like Connor said, we went to eight different location that places that we were um, in the course of a year, which is uh, hectic. <laughs> um, but what was incredible about that year was the conversations that we were having about what it means to do responsible service and trying to live those values. And um, I, I, you know, I was coming out of grad school where I had spent year, you know, years talking about all of this very theoretically and being really frustrated um, with how little conversation there was on about actually putting these values into action. And so I think I had this crash course in what it really means, um, not just theoretically in this, uh, you know, bubble where everything's possible and anything's possible, but what does it mean to live these values in like really practical terms when you're on the ground and things are, are down and dirty. And so um, I, you know, that, that also changed the course of my life and, and where my thought processes have gone. And so it, it was an incredible year. And then to be able to go back to Ghana a couple of years later and work with Yvonne um, for a year on the ground with this program in one place um, and really learn about the, the people in the place and from the ground up uh, was incredible. And so, and now, to just watch Yvonne doing it by herself has been has been a real privilege. And I, I just really love, I really am excited about what's next because I've been able to see all these building blocks come together and know how solid this foundation is. And um, I, yeah, I'm just so excited to, to move forward. And um, that's been my, you know, involvement with, with the program from, pretty early on and uh, we're coming to the, the next big, big chapter. It's even bigger than a chapter. It's like the next book of this, of this program. So uh, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be great. <laughs> and I look forward to this conversation because uh, Yvonne's got a lot of, uh, like the reasons why, why it's moving north, um, you know, it, it makes, it's good sense. Anybody who knows about Ghana understands how the, what, what is needed in the north and why it's a great place to launch this program or to relaunch it. So. Yeah. Thank you, Wendy. Um, super excited for this. Uh, we welcome any questions in the chat box. Please drop questions there. I'm going to bring back all the panelists so that we can kind of have a discussion on this and address some of the, the questions that people might have. Um, I know, Christian, you mentioned a return to the North. Could you just go into that in a little bit more depth? I know Wendy also mentioned as well. So. You know, the, the, the North is an interesting place. It's very challenging. Um, it, it definitely lacks some of the luxuries of being in the South. Um, and, but at the same time, there is a kind of, 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 a, of, a, of a, I don't know if the word is predictability, but if you, I think when you engage in a certain kind of way, uh, like openness, honesty, but respectfully, it usually allows you to form relationships um, with community folks, leaders, people who are in the community, but treated as, as outsiders. Um, and I think that kind of, relationship building facilitates the kind of work that um, we try to do here. Uh, and especially because, you know, um, one of the things that attracted me to the program in the first place was um, that, the, that the work, whatever we were trying to do was, was, was uh, based in relationship. So I feel like in some ways, it, being in the North, it, um, it makes that easier um, because of kind of the layout. You know, there, there is also, I mean, you know, you, there's a couple of ways to look at it. In a way you can say, the North is where uh, the NGO uh, sort of capital 
of, of of Ghana is, and 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 that's in, in, inundated with folks um, who are bringing maybe a more classical uh, uh, way of doing this kind of work, but it also offers a very stark um, comparison and contrast between how um, we go about doing this um, or have gone about doing this over the years uh, in the way other, other folks have been doing it. Um, and I think that's, that's important. Right, so the, I mean, I, I, I can see when people could make an argument or a sort of a thing, well, there's a lot of attention already given to the North, uh, but I think in, in some ways it might be important uh, to, to show the differences uh, of, of the ways and approaches and, uh, and why that's significant. Um, what else? I mean, I feel like Doc, <laughs> The folks, when I tried to speak Northern languages, because I've also tried and failed to speak other ones. I mean, uh, Lick Paw Paw, uh, a little bit, I might have said Hausa, some, some things in Hausa every now and then, Gonja, whatever. Um, but they're much nicer when you try to speak the language and you fail uh, than, <laughs> than, than Fonty folks. So, uh, you know, no, I don't want to start any uh, ethnic rivalries or whatever, but um, that's one of the things I've also. So notice, um, but but in, and also in a more serious light, I think in thinking about decolonization um, and thinking about uh, where in the country I've gotten a lot of resources and attention, um, and 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 the historical impact of that, um, and you know looking at where healthcare, where education, where infrastructure um, has not gone right, and and you know, you know it's it's the north. Um, and so I think it is important in terms of thinking uh, it, when you take a kind of decolonial lens uh, of, 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 of why it might be important to, to, set, to, to spend time and give energy and effort. Um, because as we know, as we kind of have some history of, 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 of the slave trade and like, you know, the fact that some um, groups benefited um, and at the cost of, you know, others and how that relationship and the sort of extractionary um, you know, approach of colonialism and, and how that has still continued to sort of manifest in the country. So I think it's important to also keep that in mind when you're thinking about like where um, attention uh, maybe should go, if it does go. Yeah, that was definitely um, one of our reasonings. I think for going into the north, looking at where the resources are, and Yvonne could probably throw a whole bunch of statistics at you. Uh, she knows the program in the area so well. Um, I know you mentioned you had a few questions about about the move. I don't know if you still have those questions, or, but Yvonne can kind of talk a little bit more about about why we decided to move in the north and specifically to Tamale. And she spent a lot of time scouting out areas before focusing on that specific um, region. So, uh, and Yvonne, if you could tell us a little bit more about that. She might be having technical difficulties again. Yeah, I mean, oh, she might be back. No. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to talk about what Yvonne's mind, you know, where her mind is with this kind of move. But uh, I know that through conversations with her, a lot of what the, the, I wish I had the just stats that are just in her brain about this um, because they're not just in my brain. Um, but the if you just look at the uh, difference in education access for uh, particularly for women in in the northern region and in the, in around Tamale, and if you uh, like the it's not just that it's low; it's like low for Ghana. Uh, and so when you compare that with some of the other regions that have a more historic access to education, more historic access to income, um, and it, it, makes, it, it makes it quite clear that if you're wanting to do women's rights and you wanna do um, vocational rights and economic justice and all of these kinds of places, the, uh, 
these kinds of issues, Northern region is where these kinds of these issues, you can have the biggest impact because it's where those statistics are, are wanting the most in the country. And so, and then add on top of that, I know that, you know, Yvonne has talked a lot about how there's a, you know, cycle of, um, of poverty for women that plays into the, um, accusations for alleged witches, and she wants to particularly find communities for these vocational pro uh, program, uh, you know, the first vocational programs and going forward that are feeder communities to try to break that cycle so that um, these young girls and women have economic power that helps them um, avoid these allegations. And so, which is not, which is a different, um, it's a different context in the South when it comes to these kinds of uh, addressing these issues. It's a, it's a slightly different context. And so it makes a lot of sense to make this move now. So in that sense, it, it really is a continuum. It really is building off of the initial um, effort, which was always explicitly about increasing access to jobs, education, and healthcare as a way to decrease gender-based violence. And we had wanted, we, we tried to partner with some grassroots nonprofits in particular, we tried to partner with Songtaba. And we found, unfortunately, something that's true for a lot of organizations, which is that Songtaba had some really effective, cheap programs. And because their most effective programs were cheap programs, they were not programs that they could continue getting funding for. And they didn't have their own funding streams to, to keep moving these programs forward. And so unfortunately, they just kept seeking new funding, seeking new funding. And they had these amazing programs that they weren't doing anything with, programs like vocational training. And so now to see that Humanist Action Ghana is moving forward with a model where you we've identified something that really works. This vocational training works. Doing it in feeder communities really works, right? So these communities where women are often accused of witchcraft and then banished, giving them access to economic empowerment and to jobs. Um, so simple, right? So powerful, so effective. Um, and, you know, for folks who are, who are thinking about contributing to this program as it moves forward, it's really efficient, right? It's a really efficient way to give money the way this program is designed. I know Yvonne will talk more about it, but the apprenticeship model that that she's set up, I just think is really beautiful. I'm excited to support it more myself. Yeah, um, like you said, Connor, it is a very efficient program. Uh, it costs about maybe $30,000 total um, for this, for 18 months, a cohort of 25 students, five trainers, and you're paying livable wages for these trainers. You're also providing startup costs, um, you're providing providing supplies for these students. And later on, these students also take the supplies to start up their own businesses. Um, and, and they're also the apprentice models you mentioned. It creates a little bit of sustainability. We call it, the, um, Yvonne has called it the train the trainer model, where the trainee becomes a trainer uh, for the next cohort of students. Um, I'm really excited you know, when Yvonne came to me and said that she wanted to move this program up to the north despite all the challenges, because there, there was the greatest impact there. Um, some of the statistics that she's thrown out there is that, you know, the gap between the north and south, even as the south has gotten more prosperous, the north hasn't. Um, between 1992 and 2006, the number of individuals in poverty increased by 0.9 million and 24.2 percent of people in the north live below the poverty line. Um, it also has the lowest literacy rate in the country at 44.3 percent for women ages 15 through 24. So those are some of the reasons why Yvonne wanted to move the program up north and I really commend her for that for taking on the challenge because you Connor and Christian have mentioned some of the challenges of of working up there. Um, so being able to create that impact is one of the reasons why as humanists we really have to you know, this is what we can do and contribute to the world as humanists so i'm i'm really excited about that 
um, and she'll be moving on. Once we transition to an independent NGO, she will be the new executive director of the organization, which we're calling Humanist Action Donna, right after the program. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions that about, about the program. Um, you can feel free to drop that in the chat box or I think everyone is unmuted as well, so. I have a question for everyone, if that's okay. All right, so <clears throat> one of the things that we wrestled with um, with Pathfinders or with the Humanist Service Corps was the responsibility to, or to telling, telling stories responsibly, right? Um, we talked a lot about um, not wanting to do poverty porn and wanting to share positive stories, wanting to celebrate, you know, celebrate people, celebrate humanity, um, while also educating people about um, the need, uh, the needs that existed. Um, as I've moved, as I have moved on from direct involvement with the program, I've noticed that I feel really uncomfortable every time I talk to people about the program, because it doesn't feel possible to talk about witchcraft accusations without basically reducing Ghana to a single story. And so I'm just curious, like, cause there, in, order to, in order to talk about witchcraft accusations, you have to talk about so much to do it responsibly. And I'm wondering what everybody on this call feels and in particular those who are still in, directly involved with the program about how to talk about that particular form of gender-based violence in Ghana without you know, perpetuating stereotypes. Just, an, just a softball question, an easy question for every, you know, and Jude, I know you got thoughts about this too. <laughs> yeah, if I, anyone... just I was going to miss something every time. I just, I, I tried every single time to do it better and better and just left, would sleep the net that night, wake up the next day and realize I could have said it a little differently and it might have been better. And I just kept doing that. Um, kept trying to make it a clear story. And then when someone asked, I refined my uh, spiel and just uh, tried to have it the same so that I was covering as much as I could in an efficient amount of time. I think that it's important. Uh, I, I feel like there is, um, particularly when we're in these kind of, um, the secular movement in the, in the United States, there's this idea of, Anytime I've talked about this, they're like, well, just, you know, convince them to stop believing in witchcraft. I'm like, well, that is not <laughs> gonna work. Um, and that's not just, that's not uh, responsible. And so I feel like, I feel a real responsibility to talk about like, what, like, what is this bigger picture that's, that's happening in the country? Why might this feel, an accusation feel right in this economic, in this cultural, in this religious, in this, in this circumstance, in this context, why does that, why it does that context or why does that accusation make sense? If it, and not just say, you know, it, that it's an, it, an ignorant thing or, or a hateful thing, but that there's this specific context with, um, you know, uh, this history of witchcraft belief in the region, but also fears of um, economic insecurity, and that that's not just a Ghanaian thing. That that's happened. That that is ha currently happening all over the world, but it's also happened in almost every place in ever um, at some point in history, and in some in some places it's happening now. In some places it was a couple decades ago. You know it, and that it's showing up in different ways. Like in the United States, we have our own economic insecurities that showing up in different accusations. It's just our our way of of 
uh, the way that that's coming out in the United States is different. And so I really try to not just talk personally, try not to talk about this in just this really like microcosm way, but try to connect these these stories to larger a larger global conversation while not just erasing the specifics of the country. I mean, it's such a balancing act. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. It's tough. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have an answer for this. It just, I, a lot of it has to do with taking more of a holistic approach to helping to explain the problems. You know, why is this going on? It really has a lot to do with what are the cultural circumstances, the economic circumstances um, that can happen anywhere in the world. And it creates sort of circumstances that are rife for, for witchcraft accusations specifically, or especially against uh, more vulnerable members of the community. So trying to focus a little bit on, on that wider picture is where I go. Um, and then because it takes a long time to see the actual results of these kind of programs, even though they're they're very quick and they're very efficient. Um, it takes years and years and years, even decades to get out of generational poverty, but focusing on the resilience of individuals in the community, I think can help sort of um, erase that othering, that sense of othering that can create these gaps uh, between people. One moment. Use my Siri. <laughs> on everything. <laughs> I, and I, I'm also worried. Um, I, I also worry about the opposite of like the silence of the story. Um, I think what's important for me is I talk about God in a lot of different contexts. I talk about my favorite food, I talk about my favorite drink, Akateshi. And I talk about all the, you know, I, I, so, so I will, you know, I don't think anyone. Uh, they may remember that I talk about witchcraft, but I think very few people will, 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 will think, look at me and think Ghana and think only witchcraft or look at Ghana and, and, and or think of Ghana and only think of witchcraft. Um, but, but I think it is important because there's a pervade, um, there, like Ghana is not the only country um, that is suffering or experiencing this. Um, uh, to be on the like, uh, uh, which uh, I can't remember the WhatsApp group, but it's, it's really terrible. Like to hear around all of Africa, um, you know, and I mean other places as well, but uh, of different different kinds of uh, uh, you know witchcraft accusations, people getting hurt. So I think it is actually really important um, to keep this in a conversation. Um, if 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 if, any, if if you all haven't seen, I'm not a witch. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's I'm trying to remember the country. Is it? Zambia, but it's a great movie. Um, there's a couple of ways to see it. If you have a canopy, it's usually free from a, with the library uh, card. And uh, also there's a black TV uh, streaming service that looks at uh, content across the diaspora called Quale TV. Um, and so it's a really great movie. And it's just, you know, it shows I think the, how important it is. Like, you know, even in that context, it's still dealing with women it's still dealing with, and also young girls, right? And, and it's like, there's like a reason why this needs to kind of, um, to stay in our, our sort of public consciousness. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, so folks um, are committed to kind of the work that it takes to, um, you know, improve, improve the status and power of women in, in, in various uh, societies. I don't think it's it's just a hard line to kind of balance between. Um, but we do kind of need to keep it in the public eye. And I think one of the things that um, that leads into a question from Jude about implementing foreign volunteerism at this time. You know, how do we how do we ensure that the story stays um, and is relevant globally? If you know we're implementing or not implementing foreign volunteers. Um, so I, Yvonne, do you want to answer that question about the foreign volunteers?
Hi, Tiff. I'm having uh, some technical difficulties, so the video keeps cutting out. Could, could you please repeat yeah. your um, question? Is there any plan to implement foreign uh, or non-Ghanaian volunteers at this time, and why or why not? Uh, no, we don't currently have any plans to uh, to do foreign volunteering. And the reason is that the program has evolved to the point where we want to focus more on uh, local leaders and local expertise. And this means working with people that uh, are from here and um, have the skills that are needed to put together our programs and, and um, yeah, I think we have evolved past that, past uh, foreign volunteering. Um, yeah, um, and just to add on to a little bit of that, one of the reasons why we chose to move this this program into an independent NGO, um, or why we're, we are going to be transitioning towards that is because we wanted true Ghanaian leadership. And even though, Yvonne has been leading the program. We wanted her to be able to make the decision without FBB um, kind of standing in the background and her feeling pressured one way or another. I think that when you have nine Ghanaians involved, um, aside from partnerships, it can create, a, there's a power dynamic there. There really is. And with non-Ghanaian volunteers, um, there there's a lot of things that can, it can be helpful, but it can also create sort of these problems. Um, when we rely on Ghanaian leadership, Ghanaian st uh, staff for the program, we are paying local salaries. We are helping to create sustainability within the community. And no one else knows better than um, the community what is needed, how to go about things, even just the, so the sewing program. Um, that wasn't just chosen randomly, you know, coming in as FBB and saying, hey, let's let's do some program because it sounds like a good idea. It was chosen because of people in the community identifying the needs. Um, and so that's kind of one of the reasons why we've decided to forego the, the nine Ghanaian volunteers. I think in, initially, just to, to shed some light, there was a thought that um, if the program, so we, we started the Humanist Service Corps with a lot of open questions, right? Including, is it possible to do this responsibly? We want to try to see if we can do this responsibly according to humanist values. We're not 100% sure it's possible. We know that there are some things we should not do that, that most programs do. So we're going to start there. But in, if it were to have remained a volunteering program, I think it would have had to become an exchange program in order to be responsible, right? Because if we're saying that Americans or Westerners just by virtue of the fact of coming from a different context would have something to offer, then we would have to also say that Ghanaians coming to another country as volunteers would have something to offer just by virtue of having a different experience. But unfortunately, um, that's not really how people see it. And unfortunately, it is way easier for people to come to Ghana to get a visa to Ghana than for Ghanaians to get a visa to come to the United States. And that's not fair, but it does mean that you really can't do a true exchange program, right? And, and, actually, and I agree with everything that Yvonne and, and Tiff just said having it be just a purely Ghanaian program is absolutely the most responsible thing. And I'm so excited to see it go that way. Yeah. yeah and I, I, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Wendy. I just wanna add that, um, you know, as being a non-Ghanaian as part of the team there, you could feel how different it was, like how it changed the dynamic of any meeting you were in. It like folks, and, and I think that you could, and, and that's, and not in good ways. Like people would talk to me and not to Yvonne when we were exactly co, uh, you know, managers at the time, co-administrators, and that's not okay. And that, um, 
you know, it's not going to be a problem anymore. <laughs> and that's fantastic. That's going to allow the impact to, to be that much greater on this, on a, on a bigger scale. So I'm, I'm thrilled that that is um, the new context for for this work because it's going to change. It changes everything. Yeah, I I really wish that we could, like Connor said, have this true exchange um, because it gets everyone out of this ethnocentric mindset. Um, if you can really have Ghanaians come over and teach you something, and then um, Americans or Western volunteers going going to Ghana and learning because you do seek to benefit as a volunteer, like Christian said earlier, there's so much to learn. You learn about culture, you open up your mind, you um, learn about people and form really deeper connections, you know, like I've seen with um, <laughs> the four of you, even though you, you haven't been like caught up, um, but th those kind of relationships still, you remember the time that you volunteer there. And I, you, there's so much to learn from both what um non ghanaians and Ghanaians, but unfortunately access and economic access is one of those things um it is very sometimes it does cost volunteers money to go and volunteer um and sometimes that becomes volunteer tourism and so people who are non ghanaian have a lot more access to those kind of funds to pay to go overseas um than Ghanaians do to come here and volunteer here but I, I am still an idealist and I'm hoping that one day that will happen and we can get that true exchange. But for right now, it isn't really possible. Um, still excited though to see a truly Ghanaian led program. I just want to add that um, although, yeah, all of the things that you've all said are true, but I also want to just add that um, I think that having volunteers in the past is like this, those things were all part of the reasons that the program is where it is right now. You know, um, everyone that was involved in the program from the very beginning pushed it towards the direction that it is in right now. You know, in all the things that I've learned, learning are the programs that work and the ones that do not work. Um, even the opportunities that I've had, um, it's all because we did have those volunteers at that time. But I also know that in the very beginning, when I met Connor, one of the conversations we had was that he had this vision in the very beginning of the program ending up being Ghanaian led. Um, so yeah, we just followed, you know, the plan that was visioned, envisioned in the very beginning. Um, maybe not in the way that we thought it would go, but yeah, I feel like it was all part of the plan. And I am grateful for all the experiences and all the things that I've learned from our volunteers uh, that have set me on the path that I'm, I'm at right now. Yeah, I, like Yvonne said, um, this program was made possible certainly by non ghanaian intervention in a lot of ways. And I think that it, it's wonderful that it, it could bring it this far. Um, and we do feel like it's kind of time to pass the torch going forward. Um, but I know this was Connor's, Connor's vision. You began this program um, and it's gone through so many changes. I'm, I'm curious to see how you view this as aligning with your original vision? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have necessarily any end goal in mind aside from that ultimately the program should be led by Ghanaians. And so in that sense, um, this is 100% in alignment with the with the vision. Um, the, uh, the other part of the vision was just to learn, right? And I think FBB and the humanist community have learned so much from Pathfinders Project and the Humanist Service Corps, now Humanist Action Ghana. Um, 
if you all haven't read the writing that has come out of the Humanist Service Corps, I, I think there's some really great writing. I mean, Jude, Christian, Wendy, Yvonne, and I, and, and all the other volunteers um, wrote some really, like we, we, we really learned a lot. I think we carried that desire to learn from our experiences and grow from our experiences. Um, and so it met my vision in that way. I think it provided our opportunities to learn and it, pro it provided us with the opportunity to, to answer that question that I was saying a, a minute ago, which is whether it truly is possible to do service responsibly in a community that's not your own. And I feel comfortable in saying that maybe we have answered that question with a no, right? That it's, it's, it's never really responsible to do service in a community that you're not a part of. And that's why I, I think it's beautiful that Humanist Action Ghana is exclusively a Ghanaian program led by Ghanaians addressing needs that are identified by Ghanaians. Um, and obviously backed by data and applying all of the values of humanism, but through a, through a Ghanaian lens. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it absolutely met my vision and, and, um, I'm so glad that I got to be part of that volunteer team that set it up because I, um, grew and learned so much from the experience and from getting to be friends with Yvonne through the experience. Can I just say, Connor, <laughs> I don't know if I told you this, but um, so Connor is, you're definitely like the reason that like, I'm doing this right now. I just want to say that um, because at the time that we met, you know, I was in this stupid relationship where I was made to feel like you know, I didn't know anything. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go very far. And you, in the very beginning, believed in me so much that I had no choice but to believe in myself too. It's just every time I think back to this, it's you know, you just meet some 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 people in life, and they just you know impact you in such a way that ricochets through your entire life. And that's that's what that moment was for me. Like every single time that you would tell me, oh, like I I, I think you're going to like do this thing and do that thing. And I'm like, what me? You you kept saying it so much that I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to do all that stuff. So whenever someone tells me now that, oh, you're so smart, I can't believe you, blah, blah, blah. I remember this moment, honestly, because yeah, it it made me believe in myself so much that I was willing to uh, learn more and, you know, open myself up to, you know, greater things. So thank you. Love you, Yvonne. Love you too, man. <laughs> Um. <laughs> Thank you, Connor, for having given us all this opportunity really to learn from um, from to learn from the program and Yvonne as well. Wendy and I have worked so much with you over the past year and watching you grow and we feel very strongly that you're ready to take on this program as the executive director of Humanist Action Ghana. So we're we're really excited there for you. Thank you. Um, and I guess um, Jude wants to know if there's a timeline for getting our training team in place and getting the NGO registered and recognized. Uh, yes, we are currently working on registration right now. Um, uh, I think we are, we are in the ending of July. By the ending of August, we should be fully registered as a Ghanaian NGO. And whilst we are working on that, we are also putting together our team. Um, I have just found someone to work with. 
uh, as a field man a field agent, someone that can go out with me into the field and um, work with the community to build the program together. And that's that's just the beginning. Um, we are looking at November, I think, to officially kickstart the program here in Tamale. And um, during this time, FBB will be working alongside Yvonne, but she is making all the decisions from here on out. Um, we're trying to take a step back so that it is a truly responsible program. Uh, I mean, thank you so much, everyone, for this wonderful conversation. I will, uh, I do want to allow time for any last comments or questions. And thank you again, everyone, for your patience as well. I know we were a little bit late getting started. Um, if if anyone is, if no one has any last questions or comments, I just wanted to uh, let you all know that we are really grateful uh, for all the support um, for for the program. And as Humanist Action Ghana moves on, you know, we're going, Yvonne's going to continue to need support as well as we try to um, make a greater impact and be more responsible as humanists. So I know every little bit counts. If you can contribute, um, we would definitely appreciate it if you could do so. You can text HAG um, 244321 or I'll have a link and I can drop that in the chat. Um, really excited to see Yvonne move forward with this and thank you so much. <laughs>